All right, so let's pick up where we left off. Um, so from oh so long ago, remember we were talking about synchronization. Um, so you know, we, we were primarily talking about locks, which you know, allow us to get you know, mutual exclusion and have critical sections where you know, only one process or one thread is, is executing at a time. So, um, and remember we talked about you know, we need hardware support for these kind of things, and we talked about two specific ways to implement locks using disabling interrupts and then using those atomic test and set instructions. And then we talked a little bit about the idea of busy waiting and how, and how you can avoid that. So today we're going to talk about semaphores and monitors. So we'll start with semaphores. Um, so basically semaphores are a way that we're going to generalize the idea of locks. So it's another synchronization primitive and we can use it in the way that we use a lock but we can also use it to do things that you can't easily do with locks. So essentially, a semaphore is, boils down to just an integer. A semaphore is essentially just an integer that has some special instructions that you use to actually update its value. But ultimately, it's, it's just a value. It's just a number. Now, there are basically two types of semaphores. Um, the first type is what we call a binary semaphore. And this is basically the exact same thing as a lock. So you know, we're going to use it to guarantee, guarantee mutual exclusion to you know, some shared resource. And so you know, this is, again, an integer, except it's only going to have two values, 0 and 1. Um, and of course, we'll initialize it to free. So you know, this should look very familiar from last class. This is essentially the same idea as a lock. You know, the lock is either free or it's, or it's taken by some process. Um, but then the second type, which is more interesting, is what we call a counting semaphore. So this is going to allow us to have multiple shared resources that we basically manage using one you know, synchronization primitive, one semaphore. Because remember, when we use a lock, you, know, you have a lock that manages one resource. We're going to be able to manage multiple resources using a counting semaphore. So uh, yeah, so as I said, a semaphore is a number, but we have two main operations, um, which, are, which should look fairly similar when we consider locks. We have weight and signal. And so then we have some you know, critical section that goes in between those two operations. So you know, if you want to use this just like a lock, you're just going to have some semaphore and you call s.wait, and that's going to wait until the semaphore is available. And then you execute the critical section, and that's where you know that only one thread is executing it at the same time. Um, and then you're going to call signal, which basically says you know, to other processes that want to use the semaphore that the semaphore is now free. So you know, that's essentially just using it like a lock. And like a lock, you know, each semaphore is going to have a list of processes that are waiting to use the semaphore. Um, and you know, calling signal will tell the next process waiting in line that it's, you know, it can go again. So the way in which this is going to differ from a lock is that you can potentially have a value greater than 1. So what a value greater than 1 basically means is that multiple processes can hold the semaphore at the same time. Right, so in the lock, as soon as one process takes control of the lock, everyone else is going to block. In the semaphore, you can have higher values rather than 0 or 1, and that's going to say you know, three different processes can be using the semaphore at the same time. So we'll get into exactly how that works. But first, let's just look at the really simple case, you know, the binary semaphore, which is essentially the same as the lock. So if we look at the you know, too much milk example, you know, previously with locks, we were talking about acquire and release. So you know, thread A calls lock on acquire. Now it's in a critical section, knows that no other thread is executing that, checks if to buy milk, and then goes and buys milk if needed, and then releases the lock, same in thread B. Using semaphores, you know, this is a binary semaphore, it's going to be exactly the same thing, only you're calling wait and signal rather than acquire and release. Mm -hmm. So let's see how this actually works. So here's how we can actually implement. Uh, a semaphore. And so this should look pretty similar to a lock. We have you know, wait and signal, and then we have some value, which remember in the case of the lock was whether the lock was free or not. That's just some integer. And then we have a queue of processes that are waiting. So what's the, what's the one difference in how we define the semaphore that's different from a lock? What can anyone see? So how about this constructor? When we create a semaphore, we're passing in this integer. So that integer is going to be the initial value of the semaphore, which might be 0 or 1 or you know, a higher value. 
And so that's essentially going to be like the number of you know, resource slots that the semaphore has. So in the case of a lock, we sort of assume that you have sort of one slot, one, res one process can take control of the lock at once. With the semaphore, you're going to have multiple ones. So when we're calling wait, what we're going to do is we're just going to take that value and we're going to decrement it. We would say value equals value minus one. And then if the value is less than zero, that essentially means there are no, you know, there are no slots available, and so you're going to block. So what you're going to do is if the value is less than zero, you're going to add the, you know, the current process to the waiting queue, and then you're going to block. And then when you're calling signal, you're just doing the opposite thing. You're taking that value and you're incrementing it by one. And then if the value is less than or equal to zero, you're removing a, a process from the queue and waking it up. So first of all, why are we doing this if value is less than or equal to zero? So what does that mean if value is less than or equal to zero? if there's no processes that are using it. So if, not necessarily, so if the value is less than or equal to zero, then what does that mean about how processes have been calling wait? So let's assume, let's assume that uh, we created the semaphore with a value of one. So the initial value was just one. So the first process that wants to use the semaphore is going to call wait. And so then what's value going to be? Right, zero. So first process comes and calls wait, now the value is zero. Now second process that's going to call wait, it's going to set it to negative one if this first process is still running. Right? So basically a negative value means that there's a process that's waiting on the semaphore that you know it does not is not able to use it right now. Whereas if we you know set if uh, value is positive, then what can we say about uh, threads that are waiting to use the semaphore? Are there any? No, if there can't, right, there can't, if value is positive, then there can't be anything waiting to use the semaphore. Because positive means you have open slots. So whenever you're incrementing value, you know, you're always taking the next thing off, the next process that's waiting, and, you know, letting it, letting it proceed past the, past the wait. Um, if value was less than zero. So if value is positive, you know no one's actually waiting on the semaphore. So let's just get, think of a few simple examples why we might want to use something like this. Right? So when you call the semaphore, you're giving it some value, and that's saying you know, how many processes can use the semaphore at once. Now, a good example of why, well, can, actually first, can anyone think of any, any example where you might want to use something like this? Right, so why is this, what, what, what's a scenario where this might be better than a lock where you essentially just have one resource versus here where you may have, you know, five of the same resource that you can, that you can, you know, give access to? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, a good example is suppose you have, you know, you have a lot of processes that need to do something and your computer has four <laughs> cores. And so you want to execute four of something at the same time, but not more than four because you only have four cores. Right? So there, you know, every time you take you know, a unit of work and you know, start running it, it'll run on some core. You don't care which core it runs on. You just want it to run, and you want to run four at once. So that's where you, might, you, know, you could use a semaphore and give it a value equal to your number of cores. And whenever you're you know, dispatching a unit of work, decrement the semaphore. Right? So what that's going to do is if you, you know, have a core that's not being used, you're going to send the, send the you know, whatever the work is, and that will start running on one of your cores. And if all of your cores are running, then that's going to block until one of your cores is finished with the previous piece of work it's doing. So a concrete example of how we might use this is, um, I think I mentioned this last class, the idea of a web server. So a common way a web server is written is you have some thread that is listening for page requests. And whenever you get a page request, you have basically a pool of worker threads, and you dispatch the request to one of those threads to actually read the page and send it out. So when you have some fixed number of worker threads, you might use a semaphore to basically you know, keep track of sending the pieces, the, you know, the web requests out to one of your worker threads. So that's another, that, so, so that's another example. 
Um, and not pictured up here, but remember we have the same uh, we have the same requirements in terms of executing things atomically that we had with a lock, right? So we need to ensure that weight and signal are executing atomically. So it's not pictured up here, but we have the same issue of either needing to disable interrupts or use, you know, test and set in order to make sure that weight and signal are atomic, right? Because otherwise, if things are executing, you know, in both of them or, or you know, two things are executing at the same time in those that code, then you know, the semaphore is not necessarily going to work like we want it to. Okay, so, so let's walk through a, simple, a really simple example of using a semaphore. So let's say we have, you know, process one, and it's going to call wait twice and then signal twice, and process two is going to call wait once and signal once. And remember, you know, the order in which P1 and P2 executes is determined by the CPU scheduler. Like, we don't explicitly control it. So here's just one, you know, let's, let's say that it executes like this. So let's say, you know, the, let's say the initial value of the semaphore is 2. So that's the initialization value we give it. And so, of course, initially the queue is empty. There's nothing waiting on the semaphore. And both P1 and P2 are, you know, executing, or, or at least ready to execute on the CPU. So let's say we first call, P1 calls s.wait. So what's the next, so what, after calling that, what is value going to be equal to? One, right? Because P, P1 calls wait, so we decrement the value of the semaphore. It was previously two, now it's one. Does, so now does, does P1 block or does P1 keep executing? Right, P1 keeps executing because, you know, the value of, you know, value is still, is still non-negative. So you keep executing. And of course, P2 is still executing, so you know, now the value of the semaphore is 1, nothing's waiting, and both processes are still executing. So now let's say P2 calls s.wait. So what's the new value going to be now? 0, right? Because we, we decrement it again, and the same thing as before. You know, the value is still non-negative, so the queue is still going to be empty. P1 and P2 are still executing. So now let's say uh, P1 calls wait again. Because remember, this is, this is a little bit different from how we were using a lock, right? Because in a lock, you either have the lock or you don't. The idea of a semaphore, right, a semaphore is fundamentally just a number. So you can call wait multiple times. You can call signal multiple times. All you essentially do is, is manipulating this integer. So let's say that P1 calls wait again. So now what's, what's value going to be? So what does weight do to the integer value of the semaphore? Right, decrements it by 1. So it's going to be negative 1. So now that the value of the semaphore is less than 0, what's going to happen to P1? Right, P1 is going to block and is going to be put on the waiting queue. Right, so you know the semaphore had you know two resource slots to load out. You know it gave you know it, it released one each time wait was called, and so when you call wait a third time, it's going to block the thread that called that. So now the value is negative one. P one is waiting, and P one is blocked. P two is still executing. So now let's say P two calls signal. So now what, what's 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 going to happen to value? What's the value going to do? Right, so you're going to add 1, so that's going to become 0. And so now what is going to happen to, to P1? Right, so now P1 is going to unblock, and you know, P1 is going to be taken off the queue, and you're going to start executing it again. And then you know, the last two times we call signal are just going to you know, increment value from 0 to 1, and then increment value from, zero to, from 1 to 2. The basic, basic idea, Claire, you know, every time you're calling wait, you're decrementing the value by 1. And if you go below 0, the thread blocks. And whenever you're calling signal, all you're doing is incrementing the value by 1. And if someone is waiting on the semaphore, you take the, you know, you take the next person waiting off and, and uh, dispatch them. Yeah? Um, Potentially, if you were waiting on multiple different events to happen, um, but 
we'll, we'll get to that, and we'll get to a few examples of how you actually would want to use semaphores. Yeah. Yes, right. So when you're using a semaphore like this with a value, when we use a semaphore with a value of 1, that's where you're making it a lock. So if, if you make a semaphore and you give the initial value of 1, it operates just like a lock and is only going to let one process in at once. So there it's functioning, you know, you can you make a critical section like that. So that was the too much milk example we looked at, where you just, sorry, <coughs> use weight and signal. And, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and then, you know, you will have a, a critical section. But when you have a value greater than one, you know, you are going to have multiple uh, processes executing the section at once. Other questions? Basic idea clear? Okay. So we went through that example. So now let's consider, you know, how we might actually want to use this. So the first example I just gave was if you want to do mutual exclusion using semaphores, all we have to do is make a semaphore with a value of 1, initial value of 1, that is, you know, a binary semaphore and works exactly like a lock. So then if you want to do a critical section, you just call wait on it before the critical section. That will set the value of the semaphore to 0. And then if anyone else calls wait, it's going to go to negative 1 and they'll block. And then once you want to, you know, once you are exiting the critical section, you call signal, and the value either goes back to one if no one is waiting on the semaphore, or if someone is blocked, then you know it'll it'll go back to zero, and the next uh, the next uh, process will will then start executing again. But now another thing we can do with semaphores um, that we can't do with locks so easily is to uh, consider is to do scheduling constraints. So what I mean by that is that we often have pieces of code that we need to execute in a certain order. And remember, in general, the CPU scheduler is interleaving things, so we don't have any control over it. But we're going to be able to use semaphores to actually impose some constraints. So let's see and look at a simple example of how to do that. So let's say we have two threads. with thread 1 and thread 2. And let's say that in thread 2 we're going to execute uh, you know, a function take exam. And in thread 1 we're going to execute you know, study OS. Right, so, so obviously we want one of these things to execute before the other one. And in general, you know, thread one or thread two might execute in any order. We don't know. So we want to force, you know, we want to force study OS to execute before take exam. So the way we're going to be able to do this is we're going to be able to do this using a semaphore. So let's say we have some semaphore S equals sem. And we're going to set the initial value zero. Right, so this is a little bit different. This is not like a lock, but we're also not using a big number. We're just going to set it to zero. Anyone see how we can use a semaphore with initial value zero to force an ordering here? Yeah. Right. So we want, you know, what we don't want to happen is this to execute before this executes. So we want, if this is executing first, we want it to block. So what we can do is we can say, you know, s dot wait. And over here, we can say s dot signal. Right, so now this could execute in either order. And if thread 2 executes first, we're going to call wait. Semaphore is going to, S is going to decrement from 0 to negative 1. And thread 2 is going to block. And then once we execute thread 1, which may be later, we're going to call signal. Semaphore is going to go back up from negative 1 to 0. And then we'll start executing thread 2. Right, so that's if thread 2 executes first. 
If the CPU schedule decides to execute thread 1 first, then signal is going to get called. Semaphore will go from 0 to 1. And now that the value of the semaphore is 1, when we call wait, thread 2 is not going to block at all. It's just going to keep going. Right, so this is, this is what we mean by a scheduling constraint, where we want to ensure that some piece of code happens before some other piece of code. You know, regardless, regardless of the way the CPU scheduler decides to run, you know, based on the use of the semaphore, we know that thread 1 here is going to execute before thread 2. Make sense? Questions on how this is working? So actually, and we could, we could also do something similar here. Let's say we have a third thread, you know, thread three, and thread three is going to execute, uh, let's say thread three is going to execute get sleep. So we want thread three and thread one to execute before thread two. So how can we do that using, using the same basic idea? What's the one little modification we'd have to make? Wait twice in thread two. Yes, that's actually one approach. Yes, you could you could essentially have wait s dot wait and then s dot wait again, and of course do the same thing here where you're going to call s dot signal. And so then you know once the first you know uh, preliminary task is done, you're going to go past the first wait and then the second one, and you're you ensure that when you hit this, both thread one and thread two have gone. What's another way you could actually do this? Yeah. Right. You could actually take this and not do zero, but do <coughs> negative one. Then you only need the one wave. And when you, you know, then this is not going to proceed until semaphore has been incremented twice. People see how that works? Right? Because then it's going to be, you know, it's, it's not going to be positive again until both have called signal. then what you'd probably do is use multiple semaphores. Because, okay. you know, we saw how you can order two things with one semaphore. So, of course, you could always multiple more things by, order multiple things by using more than one semaphore. Other questions before I continue? Um, actually, let's, let's, uh, I want to do one other quick example of how we can do these. So, so let's say that you and your roommate have spent the past you know, nine days working on too much milk, and you come up with this great solution where you're, now you're not going to both go for milk. Now you're just going to have one of you that's going to do you know, buy milk. And you know, your roommate is not going to buy milk. Your roommate is going to you know, buy cookies. And then once you once you have milk and cookies, you know, you're both going to execute these. So so what's the what's the scheduling constraint we want to impose here? Yeah. <laughs> right. You want to make sure that you've executed both by milk and by cookies before either of you executes eat. So any ideas how we might go about doing this with semaphores? Right, so we're clearly going to have to have, you know, semaphores that are doing something before you're calling eat, because that's what we want to potentially, you know, block threads before doing. Do you have a... Okay. Yeah. What? Yes, perfect. We are going to use two semaphores, S1 and S2, and what should their initial values be? Negative one. Right, so the idea is that we're going to have S1 and S2, and in one of these, we're going to call you know, S1.signal. Sorry, I 
didn't leave enough space here, but in one of these we'll call s1.signal and then s2.wait. And then in the other one, we can do the opposite and we can say s2.signal and then s1.wait. So but what do we want the what do we want the initial values to be? If we was this what you were saying? So what, what do we want the initial values to be here? So remember, when we're calling s1.signal, we're incrementing s1. So let's say that let's say that thread one is executing first. So thread one is going to buy milk, and then it's going to call s2.signal. So that's going to be incremented by one. And now let's say thread one immediately executes s1.wait. So what do we want to happen there, since thread two is not run yet? What do we want to happen? Yeah. Right. So thread two has not yet run, and we're down here, and we're about to call the you know, eat function. So we want this to block. So if this is the only thing that's executed, and we want this to block, <laughs> what should the value of S1 be? It will block on negative one. Right, but if it's negative one, then when we come over here and we call s1.signal, it's still going to be zero. Yeah, right. So s1 will cause it to block, but we want to make sure that it unblocks when we call signal over here. So these things are both going to have an initial value of zero. So whichever one, whichever thread, thread one or two runs first, it's going to increment one of the semaphores and then block on the other one because the other one is presumably still zero. And then once the second thread runs, you know, whichever will run first, whenever the subsequent thread runs, it's going to call signal, which will release the other thread, the thread that was previously blocked, and then its weight, the semaphore that it waits on was already incremented by the thread that ran first, and so it's not going to block at all. So you've essentially then enforced that whichever thread runs first is going to block before calling eat. And once the second thread is running, it's not going to block at all, and the thread that ran first is going to unblock, and then they'll both proceed. Make sense? Remember, so this is, this is how we can essentially you know, keep two threads in lockstep using semaphores. We can ensure that they get to the same point before both of them are able to continue. Any questions on, on how this is working? Okay. So let's consider a little more of a complicated example. Um, so let's return to, remember, the producer-consumer example we talked about a few classes ago, where, remember, the idea is you have a, basically a shared buffer, which you can just think of as a shared array of data items. And you have producer threads that are making items and putting them into the shared buffer. And then you have consumer items that are uh, consuming items off of the shared buffer. So we have two types of we have two types of threads. We have producers and consumers. So, uh, and also remember we had uh, you know we had two types of bounded buffers. We had um, the, rather two types of the producer consumer problem. One where you are bounding the size of the buffer, and one where you're not bounding it. So let's look at this code for actually doing producer consumer. Um, using semaphores. So, you know, we again have the separate code for the producer and the consumer. We have the shared buffer of items. And then we're going to have some semaphores. So, first of all, you know, based on this, is this a, based on this, how we're constructing this, is this a bounded or an unbounded buffer? Are we limiting the number of items in? How many items can we store here? N, right? So we're saying we're going to create this bounded buffer with a parameter n, and then we're going to create the new buffer with, with n slots. So first, without considering how exactly this code is working, what are sort of the two scheduling constraints that we have when we're doing this producer-consumer? What can we say about the order in which things you know, can or can't run? So let's consider the, let's consider the consumer. So when, when is a consumer allowed to run? Yeah. Right. So the scheduling, the first scheduling constraint is that the consumer can only run once something has been produced and is in the buffer. 
So that's the first scheduling constraint. What's the second scheduling constraint? Yeah. Right. So the producer, you know, because this is a bounded buffer, the producer can only produce when there's at least one empty slot. So, so those are the two scheduling constraints. And we are going to actually implement those scheduling constraints using uh, two different semaphores. So we have a semaphore empty that has an initial value of n. Right? And so you know, each time the uh, producer is called, the producer is using up one of those empty slots. So the value of empty is getting decremented every time you're calling the producer because you're calling empty.wait. So that's you know reducing the value of, of empty. So you know so what exactly is this enforcing? So how many times could a producer run before the next producer gets blocked? Supposing you're just running. Suppose you have you know 20 producers and 20 consumers. The CPU scheduler could run them in any order. What can we say about the maximum number of producers that could run? You know at you know one by one if they're all back to back. Remember, so each time we come through here, we are decrementing the value of empty. And when is that going to block? When's the value of empty going to block? Or rather, when, does, when is empty.weight going to block? Yeah. Right, so, but, you know, when, when empty, when the value of empty is zero, which means all of the slots of the buffer are full. Because each time, you know, each time we're consuming something, we're calling a signal on empty. So each time a consumer calls, the value of empty is going up by one. Each time we're calling produce, the value of empty is going down by one. So if empty gets all the way to zero, then that means that every single item in the buffer is full. And so if another producer comes and tries to execute, it's going to call empty.wait and it's going to block. Because you know that's one of the constraints that we can't. We need to have at least one empty slot to allow a producer to run. So you know by setting the initial value of empty to n, it means that we're we're enforcing that there is at least one empty slot to allow the producer to run. And if there isn't an empty slot, then the producer is going to block. And we're doing similar, basically the same thing on the consumer, except rather than enforcing that there's you know at least one empty slot, we're enforcing that there's at least one item to consume. And initially, how many items are there to consume? Zero, right. So initially, if, if the first thing that happens is a consumer tries to run, we want it to block. Because there's nothing, there's nothing in the buffer for the, producer, for the consumer to consume. So the initial value of full, which is the second semaphore we're using, is going to be zero. And the consumer is calling full.wait. So if there's nothing to consume, the consumer will block. And here, the producer is calling signal to actually increment that value. So if you know, a consumer comes in and calls consume, and there's nothing in the buffer, then it will block. And then once a producer runs, it will call signal on full, increment the value of full, and then the consumer can now run again. Make sense? Is that clear? How we're using, so we're using those two semaphores to enforce the two scheduling constraints, one for the producer and one for the consumer. Questions on that? Okay. And then we also have this third semaphore. And see, the way we're using this other semaphore is both the producer and the consumer are saying new text wait and new text signal after they're done. So what is that doing? What is the function of that third semaphore? Yeah. Right. So what what is it basically? What is the third semaphore? Right. The third semaphore is just a lock. Right? Because this is this is a this is a binary semaphore. We put the initial value and set it to one. And this is just using it, you know, to enforce basic critical sections. That before we either produce or consume, because remember we're accessing the same shared buffer, so we can't let them do that at the same time. So we are acquiring the lock before we modify the buffer, and then releasing the lock after we modify the buffer. And both the producer and the consumer do that same thing. So you know the third semaphore is just being used as a regular lock here, like we already saw last class. Is that clear? 
The, two, the previous two semaphores were actually using them as counting semaphores. The third one we're just using as a stand-in for a walk. And that's a binary semaphore. Questions before I move on? Yeah. Good question. So what, hap what, what would happen if we called wait on one of these first? Or what might happen? Anyone see any problem with that? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, basically, the idea is you can you could run into a deadlock, which is where no one can proceed. Because when you call, you know, when you call wait on the lock, you're essentially shutting out both other consumers and other producers from running until you release the law. So if I called, you know, mutex.wait, if I'm a consumer and I called mutex.wait, and then I called full.wait, and let's say there was nothing in the buffer. So if there's nothing in the buffer, the consumer is going to block. But remember, the consumer now essentially still holds the lock. So <laughs> what's going to happen if a producer tries to run now? Because remember, the consumer is waiting for a producer to run. But if a producer runs now, what's going to happen? If the consumer has already is, is still holding the lock. Yeah. Right. So now you have both consumers and producers are blocked, and no one can actually proceed. So we are only taking the lock for the point when we are modifying the buffer, and we, know, we're, we are ensuring that you're not actually going to get blocked yourself while you still hold the lock. Because if you didn't enforce that, then you could run into a deadlock where no one is able to run. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay. So um, this we basically, uh, I think we already essentially covered this, but you know this is just an illustrating how this process will work. We have, you know, the empty mutex that initially has a high value, the full mutex that has, or rather the full, sorry, the empty semaphore and the full semaphore, the empty one initially has a value of n, the full semaphore initially has a value of zero. And so, you know, producers are calling uh, weight on empty and signal on full, vice versa for consumers, um, and that's how, you know, we're enforcing the scheduling. So just to, you know, summarize semaphores here, so we talked about locks, and then semaphores are essentially a generalization of locks. And we can actually use semaphores, you know, to do locking. Um, and then, you know, we talked about three different purposes of semaphores. One, we can just use them directly as a replacement for a lock, you know, by using a binary semaphore, setting the initial value to one, and it's exactly like a lock. Two, we can use, you know, a shared pool of resources. So, you know, if we have, you know, ten different items, you know, 10, 10 different identical resources, you know, 10 threads or 10, you know, uh, CPU cores, um, then we can use a counting semaphore where the initial value is going to be n, you know, greater than 1. Or we can use threads to, you know, wait for a specific action from another thread, and there we can use, you know, a semaphore value of 0. And that's how we, you know, constructed this example where we're enforcing, you know, one thing happens before another. So those are those are sort of the three the three use cases for the semaphores. So uh, next, let's talk about monitors and condition variables. Um, so monitors are essentially a more sophisticated type of synchronization primitive than semaphores. So we started with locks, we went to semaphores, and now we're going to go to monitors. So first, let's consider you know, what was sort of wrong or what was what was sort of not so nice about semaphores. So what are, what are some problems people might have with, with using semaphores? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, you could use a lot of them. Um, so just from looking at some code of semaphores where you call wait and signal, was it really, is it necessarily clear like what, what that is actually doing? Right, like if I give you a lock and you say lock.acquire or you say lock.release, that's sort of easier to understand, right, than when we're using the semaphore code and, you know, what the signal and weights are actually doing is not always clear. 
because the way a semaphore is actually working is depending a lot on like what the initial value of the semaphore was, right? Because we just talked about a couple of different, very different ways you can actually use a semaphore. So you know, one problem is that they're not they're not super, you know. They're not super understandable. They're kind of complex because you can use them in all these different ways. Um, you know, another problem is that you know, what a semaphore essentially is is it's you know it's this global integer that multiple people are are modifying. Um, so that's that's not ideal. Um, and there's also essentially no direct connection between you know, the semaphore itself and you know whatever data the semaphore is using to protect, right? Because like we're sort of inserting these signals and weights all over the place. But there's no, it, it's not really clear, you know, what exactly the semaphore is related to, you know, except in, you know, the specific places we inserted all the calls. Um, and, yeah, so essentially a lot of this boils down to, you know, there's no, it, there, there's no control and it's very easy to essentially make mistakes with semaphores and not end up getting the behavior you're trying to get. So rather than semaphores, we're going to um, consider a, a better primitive, which is called monitors. So what a monitor is, is at the highest level, a monitor is basically a class. So you all know, you know what classes are from you know, Java or C++ or whatnot. You know, a class is you know, some data and you know, some methods. And a monitor essentially is a class that has some synchronization operations built into it. So it's basically a class that's providing synchronization for you. So, you know, rather than you having to handle all the synchronization yourself, you can just, you know, use a monitor and it's basically going to do a lot of the work for you. Um, and we're going to require all the data to, uh, basically the two ways it differs from a class is that first, it's going to just give you mutual exclusion. So if you have a, uh, a method in a monitor class, you're guaranteed that only one thread is executing inside the monitor. And we're also going to require all data to be private and you know the, the reason for that is that if you have public data, then anyone could modify it, and clearly, you know, your your code is not, you know, it's it's there could be synchronization issues if you know some other thread is just directly modifying your data. Um, but those those are essentially the two the two differences from a standard class um, when we're when we're talking about a monitor. So let's look at a little bit of a more formal definition. So a monitor essentially has two additional pieces, you know, other than a regular class that might have, you know, whatever data and methods and so forth. Um, so first, a monitor is going to have you know, one single lock. So that's you know one lock that is associated with the monitor. And then we're going to have um, some of the zero or more what we're going to call condition variables that are going to give us some additional abilities. Um, I won't go into details on those right now. Um, but of course, we're going to use that lock to get mutual exclusion. So the lock is going to ensure that only one thread is executing a method in the monitor at once, um, and the condition variables are going to let us do uh, are going to let us put threads to sleep inside of critical sections, and I'll get to in a little bit why why that actually matters. Um, but first, let's look at how we actually can use monitors in a, in a language like Java. So Java makes it actually really easy to use monitors. So let's say you have a class and you want to make it a monitor. So remember, what that's going to mean, essentially, is that you have mutual exclusion on all of your methods. And in Java, all you really need to do is you need to use this keyword synchronized. So if you make your methods all synchronized, then that's essentially saying that that is giving you mutual exclusion. When you have methods in Java that are synchronized, only one thread can execute them at once. So we could do something like this, where we, we have this queue that you can, you know, this is, this is essentially producer-consumer again where you can add to the queue, you can call add and put an item on the queue, uh, or you can call remove, and that will, you know, remove, will take an item off the queue and return it. And since we put this keyword synchronized here, we know that add and remove are not happening at the same time, you're not adding multiple things at the same time, so on and so forth. Um, and so again, you know, the reason, we of course need this data to be private, the queue itself to be private, so that you know, we're not executing in one of these methods and some other thread executing other code just comes in and, you know, modifies public data of the class. So, you know, this is, this is you know, safe in the sense that we are not, you know, we, we have mutual exclusion from the monitor. Um, what's actually missing from this? There's one little piece that's, that's missing from this code here. Anyone see what it is? Hmm? 
Well, so the lock, I haven't actually gotten to what exactly is going on underneath here. I basically just told you this is what a monitor ensures. Um, and the monitor has a lock. We don't actually have to manage it. The monitor is doing it for us. So that's, that's actually just sort of you know, a nice feature that you know, we don't have to manage the lock ourselves in Java, at least. But what about this, what about this remove method? So we're saying if queue is not empty, we're removing an item and returning it. So what's, what's, sort of, what's the case that's not covered there? Yeah. Right. What happens if the queue is empty? So, you know, we've written this that we want it to, you know, uh, essentially this is, again, producer consumer. We want to consume an item off the queue, so we want to remove an item and return it. Um, you know, what if there is no item? Now, of course, you could just say, well, you know, return nothing or something. Um, but let's say that we actually want the behavior of this to be when we call remove, we want it to, let's say, block until something is available to, to be removed. Right, so that's the idea in producer consumer. If you're calling consume, then if nothing's been produced, you want to block until there is something there. So this is essentially another way of, you know, this is another scheduling constraint here, where if the queue is empty and you call remove, you want to put the thread to sleep, right? So why can't we just, you know, put the thread to sleep there and then, you know, wake it up somewhere in, in add, for example? Why can't we just, you know, insert a call to sleep in there? Or why shouldn't we, rather? Right, because remember, there's a lock in here. The monitor is using a lock, and that lock is enforcing the mutual exclusion of all of the methods. So when you're executing inside this code, you're holding the lock. So if you're here and you call sleep and your thread goes to sleep, you're still holding the lock. And so if someone else later comes and calls add, they're going to block because you're still holding the lock. So that's the problem we need to deal with here, is essentially, how can we have the thread wait, but not continue holding the lock and preventing anyone else from doing anything? Um, so to deal with this, we're going to introduce the idea of a condition variable, um, which basically means it's uh, a way that we can actually use to have a thread wait on some condition and give up the lock before continuing. So, you know, what we want to do is we want to change remove so that it actually waits until something is on the queue. Um, and, you know, as I said, logically what that means is that we want the thread to sleep until something is available, but we can't just, you know, take the lock and hold it because then nothing will actually be able to be added. So we're going to use these condition variables. And essentially the idea is that when you're using a condition variable, you are going to wait until a certain condition has changed. And while you're waiting for that condition, you are atomically releasing the lock. So, so a condition variable is basically just a queue of threads that are waiting for you know, some condition to change. And importantly, this is inside a critical section, right? Because this is the problem we're solving of how do you want, how can you actually sleep inside the critical section um, without holding everything else up? So you're going to have three operations on a condition variable. Um, you have wait, you have signal, and you have broadcast. So when you're waiting, this is an atomic, these are all you know, atomic operations again. And the idea is you know, you're going to release the lock and go to sleep. And then the idea is you're going to sleep until that condition has changed. And once that condition has changed, some other thread is going to call signal and that's going to wake up a thread that previously called wait. Right, so some condition you want to wait on, you call wait, and you're still inside the critical section. So you're giving up the lock and putting the thread to sleep, and that happens atomically. And then sometime later, someone is calling signal, and that's going to you know, wake you back up. And then broadcast is just a variant of signal where you, know, you could have multiple threads waiting on the same condition variable. So when you call broadcast, they're all going to wake up. And you know, we have this rule that you can only call these methods you know, when you actually hold the lock. So you know, when you call wait, you are guaranteed to actually hold the lock, and then you're giving it up immediately. And then in order to call signal and broadcast, you must hold the lock as well. So, so that also is essentially you know, imposing an ordering on the, the operations of the, the methods of the condition variable itself. 
Um, so let's look at how to do this in Java. So you know, in Java, the names are a little bit different. Um, instead of signal and broadcast, it's called notify and notify all. Um, but it's essentially the same thing. So we have wait to give up the lock, um, notify to indicate that you know the condition is satisfied, and then we can you know anything that's waiting for that condition can go. And notify all is going to wake up everything. And in Java, the way this works is that every object can essentially be used as a condition variable. So if you have mul if you want to have multiple condition variables, you need to define multiple objects. Um, but for the purpose of this, we're just going to assume there's sort of one you know one condition variable. So here what we're doing is we just modified this a little bit. And you know, when we call remove, uh, we're going to say, you know, while the queue is empty, we're going to wait. So remember, we're in the synchronized method, so we're holding the lock, and we're calling wait, and that is you know, atomically putting the thread to sleep and releasing the lock so that you know, the thread is still inside the critical section, but it no longer holds the lock. And then sometime later, somebody can come in and call add. And because, you know, because the thread that was in here no longer holds the lock, we can still execute this. We'll put something on the queue and we'll call notify. And if something is waiting on, you know, waiting for the queue to have something in it, then that thread will wake up. And uh, when, once the thread actually wakes up, it's going to have to reacquire the lock. Right? Because this is still inside the critical section. So whenever you actually get woken up, waiting on a condition variable, you're going to have to take the lock again before you can keep continuing, because you're still inside the critical section here. So, you know, so again, you know, the, the condition, what the condition variable is here is essentially that, you know, the queue is not empty. Um, we're just calling wait and notify here. Um, these are actually methods of uh, any, actually any class in Java um, as you probably all know, you know, any class in Java is a descendant of the object class. You know, this inherit. You, you guys all know inheritance, right? Right. So you, you know, you have objects that inherit from classes above it. So when you say, you know, class A extends class B or whatnot, then you're inheriting all the methods from class B. Um, but everything in Java inherits from the object class, and the object class is actually where wait, notify, and notify all are defined. So that's why you can essentially just call notify and wait in any class. And you're essentially using the class itself as the condition variable. So if you wanted to define multiple condition variables, you would basically add, you know, uh, you could add like another private object, you know, condition variable two, and just call condition variable two dot notify dot wait and so on and so forth. But in this example, we're just using, you know, the class itself as the one condition variable, which is enforcing that there is actually an object that you can remove and return. So notice that we said here though while Q is empty we're gonna call wait. So why did we not use it just an if there? Any ideas? So remember when you call wait, you're giving up a lock and you're going to sleep. And some other time, you know, sometime later, notify is going to be called. And that's going to wake up the, that's going to, you know, take the thread, which is blocked, and it's going to put it back into the ready queue so that the, the thread is ready to run again. But what I didn't actually say was whether we actually, uh, you know, give the lock back to this thread or not. Right? Because you could have multiple threads calling remove. And... Once something calls add, you don't necessarily know which thread is going to take the lock. Um, so we actually have two different types of monitors. Um, we have Mesa and Four style monitors. And the difference is what actually happens when you call signal. So remember, when you call signal, you still hold the monitor's lock. You know, we said that that was a rule. When you're calling wait or signal, or rather a signal, uh, yeah, wait or signal, you, you must hold the lock. So in Mesa style monitors, which is what Java uses, um, when you call signal, you actually keep control of the lock. And then you know, the thread that was woken up still has to wait for the lock. So you know, returning to this example for a second, you know, what might happen after the thread is woken up here, before it actually runs again? Yeah. Right, exactly. So 
before you know, we call notify, this thread is ready to go again, but it still does not have the lock. It still has to reacquire the lock when it starts running. So in the meantime, some other thread might execute and call remove. It takes the lock and then takes the item. And then once it's done taking the item, it releases the lock again. And the thread that we woke up now might take the lock and see that the queue is still empty because it was taken by some other thread that got scheduled in the meantime. People are seeing how that works? So we, you know, in this, in this, in Mesa style, which is what Java and most operating systems are using, you know, when you are woken up, you're not explicitly given the lock. So someone else might actually take the lock before you get control of the lock again. So that's why, rather than just saying if, you actually always have to do a while here. Because it's still possible that the next time you execute this, it still might not be true because you, you, know, you were not given the lock immediately as soon as there was another item. <clears throat> um, so essentially the other approach is not really used in any actual systems, but is often used in textbooks where when you call signal, you actually explicitly give the lock back to you know, the thread that, that uh, you woke up. So if you were using that style, then this would not have to be a while, it would be an if statement because you're guaranteed that once you are signaled, you now have the lock again. And so now if you have the lock again, what's going to happen if some you know, other thread gets scheduled and calls remove? So if, 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 you know, if notify is called here, and we wake up the thread here and give it the lock, we still don't know anything about how threads are getting scheduled. So let's say some other thread somewhere else now gets scheduled and calls remove. What's going to happen to that thread? Right, it's going to block because we already gave the lock away to the thread that we woke up. So in that case, an if would be safe here because you know that regardless of how other threads get scheduled, anything else that tries to take the item is going to block until you get scheduled and you can actually remove the item. Make sense? Any other questions on that? Okay. So, so that's basically, you know, the only difference between between these two style of monitors. Um, yeah. So essentially, this is, you know, just the only what I just went over that in you know one style you may have to wait. So you're always going to have to use a while loop here with Mesa. Otherwise, you know, if statement is sufficient. So um, we looked at Java, which is is pretty nice in terms of it makes monitors um, and condition variables easy to work with. Um, it's a little bit more complicated in C++ because you don't actually have that synchronization keyword. So, so what is that synchronization keyword actually managing for you? What component of the monitor is that essentially doing automatically for you? Right. Essentially, the synchronization is inserting all the calls to take the lock when you go into the method and then remove and then release the lock when you leave the method. So in C++, you have to do that explicitly yourself. So when we're doing this in C++, you know, for each of our methods, we don't have the synchronized keyword. So instead, we have to call lock on fire at the beginning of the method and lock release afterwards. And that will actually ensure the, you know, the critical sections. Um, and then we have you know, a separate condition variable where you know, the behavior is the same as before, where we can call you know, wait on it and we can call signal on it. So essentially, you have to manage the mutual exclusion yourself but otherwise, you know, the, the concepts are, are basically all the same there. So now let's look at uh, the bounded buffer problem using condition variables. So remember, we earlier looked at this question where we were, you know, we did this using three different semaphores. Remember, we had two semaphores for, you know, the uh, scheduling constraint on the producer and the consumer, and a third semaphore that was just the lock to ensure the, the critical sections. So let's look at, at how we can do this here. So we again are going to have you know, the, the bounded buffer. And we're going to have you know, the two condition variables now. Because remember, previously we were using those semaphores, um, but it wasn't exactly clear you know, how those semaphores were actually, you know, what they were protecting. Here we can just have two you know, explicit condition variables, basically saying, you know, wait until the buffer is not full so that I can produce something or wait until the buffer is not empty so that I can actually consume something. 
And so this this sort of makes more sense when you're calling these because you know the the uh, when you're calling append, you're simply calling you know wait on empty because if you know you're if the if the buffer is full, then you're just going to wait until something is removed and then continue. And when you're removing something, you're calling full dot wait. So then you're just going to wait until you know the uh, wait until there's something to wait until there's something. To um, so you know this is this is essentially the same thing we just went over, just using you know condition variables rather than rather than semaphores. Um, and you know here we're using you know if statements again here. So these are using for style monitors. If you're using Mesa style monitors, it would be exactly the same, except we have to use again while statements for for both of the condition variables, because it might be the case that you know another thread could come in and take the lock in the meantime. So now let's consider you know, differences between semaphores and monitors, right? So, uh, so you know both semaphores and uh, you know monitors are, are kind of similar, um, and you know we both have you know we have weight and signal you know both for condition variables. And remember, just so just so it's clear, remember condition variables are you know associated with a lock of the monitor. So that's how you know condition variables and monitors are sort of you know two halves of the same thing, or rather you know. Uh, a condition variable is associated with a specific monitor, and that monitor's lock. Um, but so, you know, let's ask the question: you know, What exactly is the the difference between you know using a condition variable and say condition dot wait versus a semaphore where you're saying semaphore dot wait? So, so what's the difference between that? So remember that you know with a semaphore, you're when you're calling uh, when you're calling wait, you're decrementing the integer, and you're blocking if it's below zero. And with a condition variable, when you call, um, sorry, with a condition variable, when you're calling wait, uh, you know, you're not using that integer, you're just waiting for someone else to call signal, and, and, or notify, rather, and, and wake up the thread. So, any ideas, what, what's sort of the difference between those two? Yeah. Right, so So let's say that we're using a semaphore S, and we have you know one thread that's calling you know S dot wait uh, and a uh, another thread that's calling you know, S dot signal. So you know, again, supposing we're using semaphores, and if you call wait first, what's going to happen? So let's, let's, let's just say this is you know semaphore with an initial value of one. I don't think I'm doing a great job of playing this. Um, so. Basically, the idea is, right, a semaphore has that integer, and that integer is some state that it remembers, right? So when you call, you know, uh, when you call the methods of a semaphore, you're modifying that integer, and that integer, you know, state, that the, the state of that integer is staying between calls. So when you call signal on a monitor, what happens if nothing is waiting on the condition? Right, nothing will get notified. Is anything going to happen? Right, if you call signal on a monitor, on a condition variable, and nothing is waiting for that condition variable, nothing is going to happen. Whereas if you call, uh, if you call signal on a semaphore, you know, regardless of if anything is blocked or not, you're still going to modify the semaphore's integer. So essentially the semaphore is remembering, you know, uh, weights and signals that were called on it, whereas a uh, condition variable is waking up a thread when you call signal, but if you're calling signal and nothing is waiting on it, you know, nothing is going to happen. So, you know, to, to summarize the differences here, you know, condition variables do not have any history, you know, but semaphores do. 
you know, when you're calling single on condition variable, if no one is waiting, you're not doing anything. And, you know, if a, on a semaphore signal, you know, if no one is waiting, you are still, you know, incrementing the, the value of that semaphore. So actually, let's say, so let's say you have a semaphore and one thread calls, uh, uh, sorry, let's say you have a condition variable and one thread calls signal on the condition variable. And then sometime later, a different thread calls wait on the condition variable. What's going to happen? Hmm? If we're using condition variables, is that going to happen? So remember, condition variables don't have any state. They don't have any memory of what was previously called. So if you call wait, if you're a condition variable and you're, you're calling wait on a condition variable, by definition, you're always going to sleep. Right? That's how we define condition variables. When you call wait, you're giving up the lock and going to sleep. That's always happening. And you're only going to start executing again once someone calls signal on that condition variable. But in the case of a semaphore, if someone calls signal first, let's say some thread calls signal, and then later some thread calls wait, is the thread going to block or is it going to keep running? Right. In the semaphore case, it's going to keep running because the semaphore is essentially remembering previously that someone actually called signal. So the next thread that calls wait is going to you know, keep executing. Versus in the condition variable case, there's no memory. As soon as you call wait, the thread is always going to sleep until a subsequent signal is called. So you know, basically what this means is that with a semaphore, regardless of the order in which you, in, in which you call wait and signal, you know, that doesn't really matter. The end result is going to be the same. So if you have you know, two threads that are calling wait and one thread that's calling, let's say the initial value of the semaphore is one and you have two value or, and you have, or, sorry, let's say the initial value of the semaphore is zero and you have two threads that call uh, wait and one thread that calls signal in some order. How many threads of the two that you know, called wait are actually going to block? So if the initial value is zero, then the first, then any thread that calls uh, wait is going to block. Right. So if the initial value of the semaphore is zero, then the first, and then the first thread that calls wait is always going to block, right? And then if you call, you know, signal, then the thread will get released again. Um, the, Basically, basically, the point here is that you're always going to end up with the same sequ with the same number of threads that block or continue, regardless of how you execute the order, regardless of the order of execution of the semaphore's operations. Whereas, as we just saw with a really simple example, if you're using a monitor, you know, the order of wait and uh, signal does actually matter, because if no one is waiting, then that changes the behavior of signal. Signal doesn't actually do anything if no one is waiting. Um, now, you can actually implement monitors with semaphores. Um, I'm not actually going to go into the details here. Um, all of the code is on the slides um, if you want to review it later. Um, but basically, the key point is that in order to implement monitors using just semaphores as the basics, you need to enforce the two, difference, the two main differences that we just described, which is that when you call wait in a monitor, you always go to sleep. Whereas in a semaphore, you're not always going to sleep. It depends on the value. Um, and so that's one difference. And then when you're calling signal in a semaphore, you are changing some state that is carried over. Whereas in uh, monitors, you know, there is no state. If no one is waiting, nothing actually happens. Um, so I won't go over the details, but essentially this is just code that shows how you can actually implement that logic using just semaphores as the basic building block. Um, and yeah, so so just to summarize, you know, a monitor combines this, you know, combines a single lock 
which is providing critical, uh, providing critical sections for all of the individual methods, and this idea of condition variables. And right, the, the key idea in a condition variable is that when you're waiting for some condition, you are giving up the lock, but still remaining in the critical section. Remember, because if you don't have that, then you are essentially forced into going to sleep while holding the lock, and that you know, can cause a deadlock. So that's what condition variables are doing for us. Um, and Java has this idea of monitor sort of really built in with that idea of synchronized, and it's managing all the locking for you. Um, we don't have that in C++, but you can do the same thing by just making sure that you have locking in all, you know, between all the, for all the methods. Um, and then, you know, it, it, it is possible to implement monitor using semaphores, you know, keeping in mind those two differences that semaphores are keeping state and, and monitors are not. 